Let's move on to our last presenter before the panel discussion. Ms. Mariah Reichert is a senior at Capital University, an emerging scholar in theology and popular culture, is always prepared for a long night studying with a stash of peanut butter in her backpack. <laughs> it's a real thing. And she has a story to share with you. So please welcome to the Hinges Conference, Mariah Reichert. Hi, I'm Mariah Reichert. I'm a senior religious studies major, and I'm from Archfield, Ohio, which is a little tiny town in Northwest Ohio. As a college student, when someone asks you to introduce yourself, you generally know that that introduction, at the very least, should include your name, your hometown, your year, and your major. We're all quite familiar with the first day of classes go around and for introductions. If you know me or if you've met me in class, you've probably heard me reference my hometown in this way when I introduce myself. I feel the need to qualify my hometown. I know that the majority of people I meet won't know by name where I'm from, and I want to tell people as quickly as possible the kind of place that I come from. We moved to Archbold when I was nine. As I look back on my years growing up at home, moving is the cleaver that sharply divides one half from the other. You could say I had a charmed childhood and you would be completely correct. I was the first child of the doted on young pastor and his wife. My mom jokes that I didn't sit with her in church for years because there were just so many other people to sit with. <laughs> I had at least four sets of pseudo-grandparents in our congregation. And as an only child for a number of years, I attended many of the summer camps at the museum and at the zoo. When I was six and eight, my siblings shook up our lives and I was fully prepared to assume my awesome role as the biggest sister. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, when I was nine, everything changed. We picked up the only life I'd ever known and moved more than an hour away. Our new congregation didn't have any of my pseudo-grandparents and my siblings and I didn't stray far from my mom or our pew in those early years. I had to make new friends in a community where people don't just come into the school district very often. In my graduating class of 104, that's right, 104, there were only about five of us who hadn't started kindergarten with the rest of our classmates. I'm not saying the move was big T traumatic, but my whole world was shaken. About a year living in Archbold, my parents sat me down and said, here's the deal, we're not leaving. You're going to have to figure out how to do this. As the years began to click by, I began to make a place for myself. But Archbold doesn't fit the expected mold for 21st century communities, specifically in its religiosity. In America, where religious affiliation is decreasing at such an exponential rate that data collected only five years ago is obsolete, my town maintains an astonishingly high and almost exclusively Christian religious affiliation and engagement. Despite comparably minute denominational differences, the ideological incongruence and thus moral battle was always made clear. There was a right church to go to, point against me. My dad was the pastor of the Lutheran church, so not much room for me to go to the cool church. <laughs> there was a right way to believe. In middle school, I was chided for not numbering the commandments right. You know that crazy thing that Lutherans do with nine and 10. <laughs> At the lunch table my senior year, I had a classmate tell me I was not going to heaven because I thought that God's creation of the world, as chronicled in Genesis, was not inherently at odds with the theory of evolution. I dared to believe that God was present in science and scripture. My faith was a little too inclusive for many of my small town peers, but I couldn't understand how the science that I so admired was in opposition to the creative God that I loved. My senior year, we had to write an essay on the legalization of gay marriage and take our own position. Of all the students in the senior class, I think mine was one of maybe five essays arguing for legalization. 
As we discussed the assignment, a number of my classmates were taken aback that I would stand with the LGBT plus community. The exclusive evidence that a number of my peers used in their opposition, just the Bible. All through high school, I struggled to balance sharing what I believed that God and faith were really like and knowing that my classmates just weren't interested in a faith like mine. Then I came to college and I found myself in a community whose diversity was bigger and more beautiful than I could have ever imagined. My faith had always been this big and beautiful thing where I found comfort when people didn't understand. But suddenly it was like an itchy, too tight sweater, not big enough to hold me or the people that I met who embraced other traditions. Luckily, my faith became an itchy sweater when I was joining the religion and philosophy department and spending quite a lot of time with the on-campus ministry that now exists as Embrace. I began to hear about people who found God in the midst of oppression and brokenness and in the very parts of their lives that some felt were against some kind of sacred rule. Interreligious, black theology, queer theology, liberation theology, all of these words were like a fresh drink of water and new expanses where I could learn more. In my own work as a religious studies major, I explored. One of my favorite papers that I've ever written was on the genealogy that's found at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew in the Christian New Testament. Amid the many men listed in the genealogy, there are five women who stand in stark contrast to the others listed. Scholars have postulated for many years about what the presence of these women could possibly mean. In my paper, I argued that the women are included as righteous actors who take control of their own lives to do the work of God. But what I believe, what I believe is that even in the midst of an incredibly patriarchal society, the pains of which we still experience today, God weaves an affirmation of humanity and equality into scripture. Not even the patriarchal society of Tamar Ruth, Rahab, Bathsheba, and Mary could keep God from seeing them and calling them and preserving that call as a beacon of hope and strength for the generations to come. All through my youth, religion was this weapon used against me. The divine was boxed in, salvation was boxed in. I didn't think the right way or believe the right way. I believe that my God is a God who stands up for the oppressed and gives them their own voices. I identify as an ELCA Lutheran, but my study of religions across the globe has shown me that our traditions are not as different or incongruous as they might at first seem. When it comes down to it, I think that God is bigger than what we can think about believing the right way. And I believe that as a young scholar in religious studies, it is my responsibility to uphold voices of those who are on the fringes of society because they are the beloved of the divine. Only if we learn to create spaces in the academy, in our religious institutions, in our world, and in our hearts for our faith to listen to those voices, cast aside, can we too throw off the small faith sweaters. As a member of the majority, it's my duty to check myself and recognize that members of communities who experience oppression today might better understand a Jesus who was a political prisoner and nailed to a cross for having a faith that was too big for the majority around him. I'm committed to uplifting these voices in the communities where I practice my faith and in my work in religious studies. I'm Mariah, I'm a senior religious studies major, and I'm from Archbold, Ohio, which is a tiny little town in Northwest Ohio. Perhaps I qualify my hometown, not just because no one knows it, but because it's been my journey too. It reminds me of how I used to be, where I'm from. It pushes me toward a greater understanding and love 
for all of the ways that humanity experiences the extraordinary that I choose to call God. It reminds me that I have to keep pushing away from easy answers, away from little tiny salvation, away from a little tiny God, but rather toward the pursuit of listening to the call of the Spirit in the still small voice and in the mighty rushing wind. Thank you. Thank you, Mariah, for your words and your willingness to share.